Alright, take your Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 6. Kind of run a little bit behind this morning, so I'm going to try to move along. Part of this I preached last Sunday morning. This is a continuation of that. And uh, <clears throat> I tried to go back and look at the message last week. I don't want to re-preach uh, something that I've already preached. Um, but even if I do, I guarantee you God will make it come out different this time. Exodus chapter 6. I'm not going to have us read all of this. But we know that Israel is in bondage. We understand the idea behind it. That Israel is in bondage. We are Israel. We are people in bondage. And we want to be brought out of bondage. Or some, in some cases we have been under bondage so long. Uh, what is it that they did? You remember Charles Manson, right? But what did they do with Charles Manson when he was finally eligible for parole to legally get out of jail that he was in? Did they, did they release him? No. They said he's institutionalized. He, all he knows now is prison life. He will not thrive. He will not do well out in public life. And so we feel it's best to keep him in there. And I agreed with every time they said they're going to keep Charles Manson. And they kept that man in prison until the day he died. In other words, he served a death sentence in prison for the things that he did and the things he caused those people to do. And uh, so anyway, but the children of Israel are in bondage. Uh, they are in Egypt. They do not like it. And like I said, some people, it's the only way that they know uh, it will be a miracle of God if they ever, ever, ever get saved. But I'm here to tell you, I've seen God do exactly that kind of miracle in somebody's life. If you think that somebody's to listen, there is nobody too dead that God cannot resurrect them from the grave. Amen. There's nobody too sick that God can't heal them. There's nobody... That's too uh, wicked that God can't save them. I know some people that are too good for God to save. But nobody's too bad for God to save. Let me hear you say amen. So let's pick it up in verse um, 8. God said, I will bring you in unto the land concerning which I did swear unto you and give, to give it uh, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for an heritage. It means it's, they're going to pass it down. It's going to be an everlasting inheritance to the people of Israel. I am the Lord, and Moses spake so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. We focused on that last Sunday morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray to your God, Lord, that you would just bless this morning's service, bless the message. Lord, I don't want to just re-preach what I preached last, unless, God, you've got a different way you want to take it, a different manner in which you want to go in it. Lord, I know the power of your word is that a thousand preachers can preach the passage that I just read a thousand different ways, and all of them would be the handiwork of God moving inside of them to move in the hearts and the lives of the people that they serve. And I pray, Lord, such a thing this morning. Father, that no matter if I've already preached part of this, or uh, Lord, or I've never touched it before, God, the Lord, that you would bless it in such a way is that it blesses people brand new all over again as if they have never, ever heard the Word of God or heard this Word a, a single time in their life. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, that somebody today, somebody today, somewhere, who can hear my voice, Lord, will give their life to Jesus Christ. They will turn their life over. They will, they will do what the Scriptures are begging them to do. And that is to call upon your name and, and hearken unto your voice and listen to you while you explain to them just how much you love them. Why, God, you, you loved me so much that you gave your only begotten Son to die for my sins that if I believe in Him and His name, God, You will grant me everlasting life. Lord, I just can't wait to see what heaven's like. And I can't wait, Lord, to inherit that new body. But Father, in the meantime, I pray, dear God, that You would help me to be a better witness. That You would help me to be a better husband, 
Be a better father to my children. Lord, even now, be a better father. Be a better grandfather to my grandchildren. A better uncle, Lord, to all my nieces and nephews. Father, to be a better pastor to those that are here and those that are watching online. Lord, to be a better Christian than I ever have been. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would help me in all those areas of my life. Lord, to me, those are my promised land. Those are the areas of life that I would like to attain to. But Lord, my flesh doesn't know how. So Father, I need your guiding hand to guide me and lead me into Canaan land. For I know not which way to go. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would use that for your kingdom and let it be a blessing to all of those who hear. Lord, I love you and I, I praise you, Lord, for everything you've done for me. And I ask you, Lord, to bless this message. Father, open up my eyes, open up the eyes of all those who are here and those who are listening. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, uh, last week, uh, we looked at this um, just briefly, but we looked at, uh, aside from having an addiction... This is what Canaan land can and will represent to various people uh, who are in this church or people who are watching online. Uh, it, and even, even your ordinary, just average, run-of-the-mill, Bible-believing Christian, they will have issues in one or more of these areas. They will have a, a serious flaw in their life or they're a serious issue in their life and... They know, they know what's right. They know uh, what it takes to be right. But God have mercy on them. They don't know how to live right. And just as, you know, some people, they were raised in church. That means they were trained to sit in church. They were trained to sit. Sometimes we, we know a young man uh, who we saw grow up as a little boy. Uh, he is a pastor's son. He has Down syndrome. He has to wear uh, 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 earpieces because he cannot hear. He can just hear uh, muffled sound through those things. He knows sign language. And like I said, he has uh, Down syndrome. And he's what? About 20 some odd years old now. They, this pastor and his wife, they raised that son of theirs to sit through six to eight hours worth of nonstop all day camp meeting style preaching and sit in church during all of that time and never make a sound, never, never throw a fit, never get up and start hollering at everybody. They trained, they were able to train that young boy to be able to sit in a church house where some people say, oh, my children, they just can't sit in a church house. Fooey on that. Why don't you train them? Train, the Bible says train up a child. It doesn't say just horse whip them. So let's train up a child in the way you should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it, the Bible says. And I believe, I believe it can be done. But anyway, let's look at uh, your life right now. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's issues in your marriage. Maybe there are things troubling your marriage right now. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's you. Whereas all this time you were praying, God fix my spouse, God fix my wife, or God fix my husband. Oh God, they're not living according to you. Oh God, they're not doing what's right. Why, do, why don't you just pray, God fix me. If I'm the problem, fix me, God. Bad marital relationships. That's Egypt. Canaan is to have a happy, strong, loving marriage. Number two, to have troubled children. Uh, you want to blame every, everybody else on, on your kid's behavior? Oh, they hang around so-and-so's kid. Well, so-and-so's kid does this, and so-and-so's kid does that. And that's why my kids got into all that trouble. It's, it's all those other kids in the neighborhood. They got them in that trouble. No, your kid got in trouble because he wanted to. He did exactly what he wanted to do. And that's your problem right there. Troubled children. But God, God... God can give you respectable children, godly children. You say, well, they're 18, they're 20 years old, they're 25 years old. I can't do anything with them right now. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. My brother-in-law is a living testimony to it. 
He watched his mom and dad and his sister live a Christian life, live a life that was in fear of God, live a life that uh, worshipped the the uh, the God of salvation that they knew the word they knew the word of God. He saw that in their lives and at, toward the end of her life, he got right with God and God. He's in the real promised land now. Amen. God can do it. God can do it. Uh, or to have maybe children have wicked parents or wicked relatives. The, the Canaan land would be parents whose lives have been changed by God. Bad financial issues. That's Egypt. Christ-centered financial decisions. Pastors with ungodly or dead church. I want to talk about that in a minute. Christ-centered uh, a church where um, a church will make Christ-centered uh, financial decisions. That goes with bad financial issues. Church members whose spirituality exceeds their pastor and or leadership. And what they need is pastors and or elders who honor the word of God. I'm going to tell you a story this morning. I, I have permission to say it. I'm probably not going to get all of it right. Because I just heard it this morning. Brother John Uter. Y'all Y'all know him. Wonderful man of God, good preacher, godly man. I love him. I've stayed in his house more than once. Him and Kathy are good friends of ours and so on. Uh, John was called, he believes, to a... There's, there's two denominations of Church of God. One denomination is a very charismatic, Pentecostal type denomination. The other, Church of God, they are located and centered in Anderson, Indiana. And... Um, they tend to be more like us than they do uh, what some people would call a, a Pentecostal or a charismatic church. And uh, so anyway, John uh, was looking for a church to pastor. He went and tried out at this church several times. They said, oh, we like you. We like you. Oh, you're a good man. Oh, we want you to be our pastor. So God finally, uh, God finally released him uh, to, uh, from that burden to be their pastor. And the church voted on him, and uh, he got a good vote, so he decided, I think I'm going to go there and be their pastor. So he's their pastor now, up until this morning. He called me this morning and said he's already quit that church. He's resigned that church, and he told me why. He said the, uh, the church treasurer has been embezzling funds from the church, stealing the cash out of the offering plates, just taking it. It's not the first time I've heard anything like this. This tends to be a common thing nowadays. I knew a church out in Oklahoma. One of my good friends used to pastor that church. That church secretary, the lady who they trusted to handle all the money, I, I kind of knew, got to know that lady from the camp meetings that we did out there. And anyway, uh, she uh, handled all the church funds. You know what she started doing? She got in debt in one of them Indian casinos. Is that, is that hard to do? Oh, it's easy to do, isn't it? She got herself in debt. The only way she could figure to pay the debt back without her husband finding it out, because her husband then would take and cut up all the credit cards and all that stuff, she finally, uh, she started taking church money and then cooking the books. And when it all came out and the pastor found out about it and her husband found out about it, she went home, took a big bottle of pills and tried to kill herself. Uh, but she was saved there at the end. But anyway, uh, Brother John found out uh, that the treasurer was stealing funds from this church. I don't know how many thousands of dollars, but it was in the thousands of dollars that she had taken. And he had a meeting with, with the entire church. He said, I want, the, I want this treasurer there. I want the board there. And I want all the people in this church there. We're going to discuss this thing and figure out how to get how to fix this problem. Did you know that they came to that church? Now, the, the husband of this woman who's been stealing the money, he's on the board. Well, guess what? 
He laid a motion on the table that said, I make a motion that we don't do anything about this. All those in favor say aye. Some people voted. No. Motions carried. So it went away. All he wanted was for the, the uh, guys on the board to have a look at the books of the church to find out what's been going on. And her husband made sure those books never saw the light of day. Pastor John Uter told those people, he said, it says in the Bible that you're to pray for those who are over you because they watch for your souls. And he said, that person is me. And he said, if you're not going to do right, you're not violating me. You're violating the word of God. And he said, if you don't get this thing fixed, and he said, I see now why God brought me here to this church. I know exactly why God brought me to this church. I could have been just a guy who let that roll, but got a little piece of it under the table. Maybe that's what the old pastor did. I don't know. But he said, God sent me here to make everybody in the church aware of exactly what's going on inside this church. And you know what? When they said, well, we're, we might just ask for your resignation. He said, there'd be no need. He said, I'm done. He said, I'm not even coming back. He said, I know I'm supposed to give two weeks notice. Do you want me to come back for the next two weeks? And they, the board said, no, we don't want you back two weeks. So he said, I'm done then. I'm going to pack my stuff up tomorrow and I'm going to be out of here. He said, you know, 16 people walked out of that church with him that night. I'm telling you, that stuff's everywhere. That church, God will write Ichabod. You know what that means? The glory has departed. There'll be no glory of God inside that church. Now, Acts chapter 8, verse 22. You want to turn there, follow here with me? Because I'm going to show you something here in a minute. I, I'm pretty sure I did not show you last Sunday. Acts chapter 8, verse 22. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. What is he speaking about here in this chapter? Acts chapter 8. Does anybody know? Acts chapter 8. Um, huh? Uh, Stephen was stoned... Uh, and in Acts chapter 7, in Acts chapter 8, um, Simon, the magi, the, the magician, wanted the power that the apostles had to lay on people and give them the Holy Spirit. And Simon Magus, Simon the magician, said to the apostles, uh, verse 19, he said, Give me also this power uh, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And he, it, verse 18 says, He offered them money. Verse 20 says, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. That is a, a passage of scripture that Joel Osteen will never preach out of. Joyce Meyer will never preach out of. Creflo Dollar will never preach out of. Frederick K.C. Price will never preach out of. And all that other ilk and all those other people. You won't hear that out of the Catholic Church. You will not hear that out of most churches. Because they will willingly allow sin to continue in their church. There was a former pastor of this church who told me concerning another family. This goes back before I was pastor. Lisa and I had just gotten married. He told me. He said, I want you to pray for so-and-so. And I said, okay, why? He said, because they're thinking about leaving this church and we need their money. I'm not making that up. Not making that up. What is it the Bible says, Thy money perish with thee? 
Um, but anyway, give me this power, he said in verse 20. Peter saith unto him, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. The Catholic Church is still selling indulgences. That's bondage. That is bondage. You know what that says? If you're wealthy, you can get away with a lot more than if you're lost. Okay? They still sell them. Indulgences are still done. Uh, usually, a lot of times they'll wait till some old crow's dead. And then this priest will go to their, his, his widowing, his uh, mourning widow and uh, say to them, now your husband's in purgatory. And he didn't have the last right set on him, or is this always something he didn't do? And he's in purgatory. Now, we can pray masses for your uh, former husband to get out of purgatory quickly. But if we don't, we'll have to leave him there for a while and let him suffer through it until he's paid his debt. That's wicked. That's evil to tell people that. And that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. That's If you're in bondage to a to a church or a religious denomination or whatever, you are in you're in the worst kind of bondage that there is. You're in your soul is in bondage. Because you've been told to believe that your soul is still in chains, even though Christ died for you, and you believe that Christ died for you, you're being told by other people that your soul is still in chains of bondage and, and that you are not free and never will be free until enough money is raised so that they can say masses for your family member to get out of it's like getting out of getting a get out of jail free card it's exactly what it is and so in verse uh, uh, 22 the bible says repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray god if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee for i perceive that thou art in the, watch this the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity now i want you to look at that phrase gall of bitterness I don't care what kind of sin it is. If it's a sexual related sin, it will always feel good at the beginning. Afterward, it's almost almost as bad as hell. If you're in the sin of... Uh, Booze, alcohol. Well, getting buzzed by alcohol might feel pretty good. But in the end, does it still feel good when it's wearing off and the liquor's wearing off? Does it still feel good? No. Drugs. When drugs wear off, depending on how bad your habit is, when the drugs wear off, now you're facing with uh, coming down from all of that and uh, you're in withdrawal and that that's a horrible horrible thing. it's like DTs with a drunk delirium trimmings with a drunk you start see things you start questioning things that are looking at things that aren't there and it's a, I mean it's a horrible mess and no matter what sin it is it feels good at first, but once you've committed it, all of that's gone. Boom, gone. Just like that, gone. And now you're in the gall of bitterness. Uh, Jeremiah 2.19, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter, that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my, feet, or my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord, of God, the Lord God of hosts. I want you to look at that verse again. Jeremiah 2.19, you might want to turn your Bible to that. That's a good verse. <clears throat> the Bible says, now this is, I, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that this verse is for someone who is already a knowledgeable Christian. Someone who knows what the Word of God, someone who knows what it's like to be born again, someone who knows um, the, the grace that comes on your life, someone who uh, has experienced God's power in their life 
And there's nothing like it. I mean, there is nothing like the grace of God in your life. When you come to an awareness of it, where you realize, man, I'm saved. My goodness, all of my sins are forgiven me. And according to the Bible, I'm going to go to heaven. And uh, when I think about all the things that I did, all the stuff that I said, all the stuff that I was a part of, when I, when I see all the sins that I committed, and to know now that every one of them are gone and forgiven. I mean, I just can't, I can't get over that. I weep all the time because I'm just so thankful God did that for me. Isn't that something that how God does that in your life? Raise your hand if you know exactly what I'm talking about. Amen! It's like you had an old-time, old-fashioned Holy Ghost black revival. Amen! Where there's dancing. I won't do that. And organ playing and all that stuff, man. I mean, they love it. You had a revival like that. You got, you got free. Wednesday night, a young man walked here in, in the middle, right in the middle of my preaching Wednesday night. How dare him? It was Philip. He had just gotten out of jail that day. Come in all smiles. We hugged him. Amen. Huh? Sunday? I was thinking it was Wednesday. But yeah, he come in all smiles and everything like that. Just tickled to death. What do you got to be happy about? I'm free! Amen. But, Jeremiah 2.19 now. Let's say, let's say now you're saved, you're born again. And you're in a place now where you think you can't sin no more. Are you, are you with me? That place... Where you think you're not going to sin anymore. So. All of a sudden now the devil. Starts tempting you. And he's just laying on the temptation. Laying it on. Laying it on. And it gets worse and worse and worse. And worse and worse. And all of a sudden. You fall. The Bible says that just man falleth every time, seven times. So there's, it could be expected. So notice this verse, Jeremiah 2, 19. He says, um, thine own wickedness shall correct thee. And thy backslidings shall reprove thee. What's the best way to learn not to do something anymore. Is it by somebody repeatedly telling you, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that? Or it's when you do it and you fail and you get trapped or caught or whatever it is. And then you realize that's why I shouldn't have done that again. You've got a lesson that you need to learn. And, and, it is God who is doing this in you. It is God who is allowing you to go and fall away just a little bit. For you to remember why you walked away from that to begin with. You walked away from it because of the way it tore your life apart. The way it took your happiness away. The way it laid burdens that were too heavy on you. Now you can't stand up. You can't bear the burden anymore. You don't want to bear the burden anymore. And you, you remember the bitterness. You remember the pain. You remember everything that goes along with that. And you say to yourself, that's why I quit. It hasn't gotten better. I go back to it and it's, it's the same or the worse every time. Ask anybody that's an alcoholic. Ask anybody that's a drug addict. Ask anybody that's addicted to uh, online stuff. Ask anybody that's ever had to deal with any kind of addiction or any kind of lifestyle like that. And they will tell you. Going back to it is far worse. In fact, take your Bible. Take your Bible. This ain't up, this ain't up on the notes. So you won't be able to see it unless you read it. In... Um, 
Let's see here. Where am I want to look at? Second, Second Peter. No, yeah, Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. Look at verse twenty-one. I'm going to give you a minute to get there. Second Peter chapter two. Verse twenty-one. Here's what your Bible says: For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them but it is happened unto them according to the true proverb the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire and isn't it true Dogs will lap up their own vomit. Is that true? And is it true that if you... Uh, our music teacher, mine and Melissa's music teacher, Mr. Dennis Knoll, used to have a little cartoon on his office window. And it said, never try to teach a pig to sing. You remember that, Jerry? It wastes your time and it annoys the pig. That's called casting your pearls before the swine. Amen. But that's what happens when you go back to sins that you thought they were going to feel better to you than they ever did. No, they're not. It's going to be worse. And now you're back into it. Now you've got to start all over again trying to climb back out of it. And it's not easy. And so it brings bitterness. And uh, Jeremiah says the same thing here. Uh, know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that thy feet, thy, that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. Now, turn to Revelation 17. We're going to understand something from the Bible about what kind of spirit it is that would compel you or draw you back in to the same old sin. You know, if you keep if you keep turning around and heading back to Egypt, I'm going to give you something so profound that you will probably want to give me a million dollar a year salary for saying this. I'm going to give you something so biblically profound. It's just it'll blow your mind. But it sounds something like this. If you keep turning around to go to Egypt, you'll never make it to the promised land. Write me a check. Wasn't that smart? Probably the smartest thing I ever come up with. If you keep turning around facing Egypt, you will never, ever, ever make it to the promised land. Face forward, eyes forward. Press on toward the mark for the prize and the high calling in Christ Jesus. Amen. Quit going backwards all the time. So in Revelation chapter 17, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. This is the woman who is tempting you. She is teasing you. She is trying to get you to sin. She's arrayed in uh, purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Having a golden cup in her hand. Full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. See it already. Already we have two types of sin here. We have drunkenness. And we have fornication. And both of them. And let, let me define. Let me make this real easy for you. And define both of them. Drunkenness is not being sober. If you're high, you're drunk. If you are drunk, you're drunk. When you put in too much alcohol, you're drunk. When you pour in too much drugs, you're drunk. And any, any other substitute that you can get high or drunk with, it's, it's the same thing. You are 
appeasing the lusts and the desires of your flesh. Now, and then of course being drunk is the absence of being sober. So she has both a golden cup in her hand. It's full of a type of wine that is abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Have you seen these churches where the, the pastor or somebody, they act like a drunk man? And they say, oh God, oh there's no feeling in the world than the feeling of being drunk in the Holy Spirit of God. I actually had uh, Stan Johnson of the Prophecy Club uh, come to me after I got done speaking one night. He came to me, him and his wife. He said, you know, my wife and I were talking while you were speaking on a certain subject. And he said, obviously, he's never been drunk in the spirit, has he, dear? <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to be either. Be sober. Be vigilant. Amen. For your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If you're drunk, you'll never see that lion coming until you, till you're dead. But anyway, she is, she has a golden cup in her hand. It's full of drunkenness and it's full of fornication. Horrible, horrible sins that destroy marriages, that destroy families. Now turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. This is one of those things that to those who are born again, it's obvious. To those who are not, this is something that, this is part of the wisdom that the Bible has in it that you need to learn. I had a man in my church down at Richwoods. His dad was a deacon in the church down there. And he, he would come intermittently in other words he'd come for a while supposedly get right with god and then he'd bail out come back for a while bail out come back for a while bail out and he got a divorce during this time married another gal and she got him helped him get back in and so on and his dad and mom told me they said you know he we right now we we pretty sure he's not drinking but just kind of watch him because we know that once he gets back into drinking again, it won't be long to where he'll be out of church and he'll, he'll, he'll never come back. I said, well, I'll help you watch for that. One, one morning, I was teaching Sunday school like I did this morning, and I said something about, um, I don't remember what it was, being drunk or drinking or something like that, and, and he quoted this verse, I mean verbatim. He quoted this verse verbatim. He said, I know the Bible says that you can do anything you want to as long as it's in moderation. I mean, he quoted that word for word, John. That whole verse, word for word. I'm joking. There is no such verse as you can do anything you want to as long as it's in moderation. And I, and I, I tried to countermand what he said with scripture. But I went, uh-oh. He's already set himself up. His mom called me and she said he's he lives with them. And she said he's on the phone all the time talk, talking to his two brothers, talking to friends of his. And she said, I can hear him bringing it up about alcohol. And he said he is he he's calling all these people. And I said, let me tell you what I think he's doing. I think he's looking for somebody to give him permission to go drink. And I said, when he finds that person. He's going to he's going to use that. And he's going to go get drunk. And if you say anything to him, you say, hey, listen, that's wrong. That's, the Bible says that's wrong. Yes. He's going to say, well, my friend told me such and such. So it's OK. Now, I want you I want to show you. What the devil's got waiting for you with your sin. The sins that you wanted to be gone. That. Paul said they do so easily beset us. Deuteronomy 32 verse 31. For their rock is not as our rock. Even our enemies themselves being judges. I want you to notice in this verse. That you have the word rock 
in lowercase and the word rock in uppercase, or the capitalized rock, R in rock. That rock is a reference. Let me see if I can get a little pen here. There we go. That rock is a reference to Jesus Christ. Is he the rock? He's the rock of our salvation. He's the chief cornerstone. Amen. He's the stone cut without hands. He's the rock. And even our enemies know this. That's why they hate the rock. Amen. They hate it. For their vine. Watch this. For their vine is the vine of what? Sodom. And of the fields of where? Gomorrah. And according to... And I want you to do this. I want you to read Ezekiel chapter 16. Write that down. You'd be surprised. You know what the Bible says is the sin of Sodom? I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to have you go read it. There are three things that the Bible specifically says word for word is the sin of Sodom. And you're going to go read it in Ezekiel 16. Aren't you? One person. All right, that's enough. Then he, noticed, he said, their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes, watch this now. Their grapes are grapes of what? Gall. Their clusters are how? Bitter. God is telling you that the sin, the old life that you're craving right now, it's going to be full of bitterness. You'll dry up. Nothing will ever make you happy. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Well, we know who the dragon is, don't we? Dragon is the devil. The asps are serpents. They're snakes. The devil is there waiting for you to come back. For you to get involved in your old sins again. So that he can now have you and keep you this time. And never, ever, ever let you go back. I love the fact that the Bible refers to your old life, your old sins, my old life, my old sins, my old disobedience with God. God refers to that as bitter, full of gall. And God made it that way because, I'm going to go back to this very quickly. He wanted you to know that your own wickedness is going to correct you this time. And your own sin is going to correct you. It's not going to be God. God's going to let you get into it. And when you see all the devils that are around that, you're going to go, uh-oh, I, 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 that scares me. I don't, I don't want to go over here anymore. It'd be like if you went on that, that thing called scared straight. Where you've never been in prison before and they take you as a juvenile and they take you to one of the meanest, hardest prisons there is and, and let you stay in a prison cell all day long with some guy. And you have to learn prison life the hard way. By the end of that day, you're screaming, get me out of here! Get me out of here! I don't want to be here! That's what God will do. With your sins, He will make them to you so bitter that honestly, you will never, ever want to go back and do that ever again. God can do that. Do you believe that? So here's what we're going to pray this morning. We're going to pray that God makes your past so bitter and so full of anguish and it's not going to be like getting the old gang back together oh we're going to have us a good time like we used to there is no used to anymore because the moment you step back you're going to find out that that life is a life that you need to leave behind and you need to leave it behind for good no 
going back ever. No going back ever. I've seen people who have gone back. They're not happy. They are not happy people. Let's stand to our feet.